Well, good morning, church. If I uh, haven't met you yet, my name is Chad Kettler. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so uh, thankful that you're here. If this is your first time, we praise God for that. Um, if you haven't seen the news, uh, the Queen has passed, and um, it's crazy to see King Charles III now take the throne. I mean, he is, I think he was three years old when she was, um, became queen, and so he's waited 70 years. This has been building for a long time. And what's crazy to me is we've seen the relationship between Charles and Diana and Camilla and all the craziness that their life has brought. And um, I've, I've watched shows and movies about uh, Charles and, and Diana with my wife, and it, it's so surreal to me. It almost seems fake, but then when you see Charles now as king, you're like, oh, wait, this is real. Um, And Diana's life and just their marriage in general was just a tragedy, wasn't it? Just an absolute tragedy. And one thing that was true from the beginning, a few years into their marriage, is they they started out so uh, on fire for each other, so fervent in their love and devotion and their loyalty to each other. But very quickly, that fervency was diluted and that fervency was snuffed out by infidelity. And what became the mark of their marriage while she was still alive was just this infidelity And it was just this tragedy when she passed away at such a young age. And now we see sort of Charles' life carry on. He becomes king. And it's just really hard uh, to watch that and just think about the weightiness of what happened and the weightiness of what's happening now in their lives. You know, it's, it's interesting when I think about the word fidelity, I think about the church. I think about the fidelity that, that we as the church of Christ are called to have to our groom to Jesus, because it is so easy for us on a personal level and also so easy on a collective level as a congregation to start out well, to start out with passion and fire for Jesus, both in our private prayer closet and as a congregation. You think about when a church is planted, there's all kinds of excitement, there's all kinds of momentum, everyone's focused on evangelism and worship and selfless service. And our church has been around for, I think, 127 or so years, 128 years maybe. And uh, we, I'm sure we started that way. We started as a small group of people, and we probably had this fervency for Christ, this fidelity to our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And, and n- n- things have not always been easy as a church. Sometimes we've had peak seasons. Sometimes we've had valley seasons. And every single church that is started and planted has that temptation to lose that first love, to fade from that fidelity that we have to our groom. Jesus actually addresses seven churches in the book of Revelation, seven churches, and he basically says, this is what you've got going for you, good job, and because I love you, I'm also going to point out what you are lacking. He even goes so far as to tell the Ephesians what? He says, you you have lost the love you had at first. What Jesus is doing is because he is such a loving groom, and because he loved us and gave his life for us and paid the cost for us and shed his blood for us, he's pointing out the flaws that the church has, the infidelity of those churches so that they repent because he disciplines the ones that he loves. Jesus wants fidelity from his bride that he purchased. He wants fidelity from us. He wants faithfulness. He wants loyalty. And so the reason I'm talking about the word and idea of fidelity is because this morning we're focused on how the church is the bride of Christ. Now, you might have heard uh, this topic taught where it's like, hey, you individually are the bride of Christ. But that's not at all how the Bible thinks about this or speaks about this. The Bible does not speak of me as an individual as the bride of Christ. The Bible speaks of us collectively as the bride of Christ. Like we are the bride of Christ. We are never the bride of Christ on our own. We are the bride of Christ. And he is our groom. Now, I want to show you a few texts that point to us being the bride of Christ. We're going to move through these fairly simply here. The first one is in Revelation 19. This is right before Christ returns. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let's rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We know that Jesus is the Lamb. And we know from Ephesians 5 that the church is 
His bride, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. I remember when my wife came down the aisle at our wedding, and she was, whole, she was spotless, without wrinkle. That dress was perfect. Her skin was perfect. Her teeth were perfect. Her eyes were perfect. Everything was perfect about her. Right? She came so beautiful down the aisle. That's the idea that, that Christ, through his sacrificial death, has made us what we are not by nature. He has made us spotless and beautiful and lovely. Not because we are, but because he has made us lovely. He has made us his bride. He goes on later and says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's marriage in Genesis, but guess what marriage in Genesis really points to? This mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What is your marriage about? Your marriage exists to point to the greater marriage, the marriage between Christ and his church, his bride. So all that is to say is we are the bride of Christ. We are the wife of the lamb, not you individually, but us collectively. And what I want to do for the rest of this message is I want to ask three questions and I want to give you three responses to those questions and then ask the questions, so what? Big deal, so what? The first question is, how did we become the bride of Jesus? Secondly, what is our relationship status now? Thirdly, when will this marriage be consummated? When is the wedding day with Christ our groom? And then we want to ask the question, so what? So first, how did we become the bride of Christ? And I have a very simple three-word answer. We became his bride because the Father chose us to be his bride. The Father selected us as a bride for his son, Jesus, and the Father gave us as a love gift like a bride to his son, Jesus. Jesus. If you see in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. The Father predestined us. The Father chose us to be in Christ. The Father selected us, and he redeemed us through the work of his Son on the cross. More than that, I love John 17. It talks about the Father giving us to Jesus. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Those who believe in Jesus, those who repent and believe on Jesus, are given by the Father to his Son, Jesus. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Now what I really wish we had from ancient times is the bridal price. I really wish we had a dowry system. And I'm going to say that us dad, hey, I've got baby three on the way. Could be a girl, could be a boy, we have no idea. If it's a girl, I'm going to require a dowry. I'm just saying. I I chose my bride. I chose Erin. Erin Lindsay, I chose her. I did not pay a bridal price for her, although I will say the bling bling is expensive. And then I found out there's a second ring, and I almost almost fainted. I really almost fainted when I found out there was a second ring. I was like, I've worked so hard for this first ring. I can't believe this. So I just let her pick that one. We just picked that one out together. But I chose my bride. I didn't pay a bridal price or a dowry. But the father chose us for Jesus, and the father made sure that the bridal price was paid. I've always said that salvation is entirely free for us. You can't work for it. You can't perform for it. You can't be good enough for it. 
You can't, you can't merit salvation. You can't merit God's love. You can't merit eternal life. There is nothing you can do. And although it's free for us, it's extremely expensive for God. You better believe that the price, the bridal dowry that God paid to give us as a bride to his son was extremely, infinitely expensive. And it was the life of his son, Jesus Christ. It was the life of the son of God. We see in Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He loved his bride and gave himself up for her. It was the very blood of the God-man, Jesus Christ, which is the bridal price paid to bring us to Jesus, to cleanse us of sin, to make us a bride fitted for the Holy Son of God. The Son of God deserves a holy bride, and the only way you can be right with God and holy before him is through faith in Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. So yeah, I chose my bride. I didn't pay a bridal price, but the Father definitely chose us for Jesus, and he made sure the price was paid. I mean, if I had to give a bridal price, it probably would have been, let's see, Aaron's dad loves uh, firearms. So probably would have come and said, hey, can I have your daughter, daughter's hand in marriage with a duffel bag of guns behind me, you know. I think for me, you could satisfy me. If I have a daughter, you can satisfy me with a Canes gift card. It needs to be very big. But I think, you, or a Costco gift card. You could satisfy me with either one of those. I'm just saying. Well, you know, all we have to do, I mean, all we have to do, these, these, these young guns are going to come trying to marry our daughters. All we have to do is say, hey, you know, there used to be a dowry. That's what I expect. You know, that's all we have to say. So how did we become the bride of Christ? How did the church become the bride of Christ? Well, we were chosen by the Father, given to the Son, and the bridal price of the life of Jesus on the cross was fully paid. That's how you become part of the bride of Christ. That's how we become the bride of Christ, completely by grace. God pays the price, God chooses the bride, and Jesus gets the wife. We are special to God. We are special to Jesus because Christ loved us so much while we were dirty and filthy and unlovely like a prostitute that is strayed from God. Jesus laid his life down for us and cleansed us. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood apply. What a great song, right? That blood washes us collectively from our sin and we become a bride fit for the Lamb. Secondly, what is our relationship status with Jesus now? Because I don't know about you, but usually when you're married, you live together. Usually when you're married, you're not physically apart. But if we're the bride of Christ, then why isn't he here? And what's our status of relationship with him? It's certain that Jesus has entered into covenant with us, his bride. He has entered into a binding covenant and he will be faithful to his promises and faithful to his covenant to his bride. But the wedding day hasn't come yet for us. We are betrothed. We're in a betrothal period. And I'll show you this in 2 Corinthians 11. I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness, Paul says. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. There it is. We are betrothed as the church to Jesus Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Think fidelity. That was Paul's fear. That's my fear. That should be your fear, in a sense, an anxiety that is almost healthy, that, that we would be anxious about fidelity to Christ, knowing that he's going to be faithful to us. That we are betrothed as the church, as a pure virgin to Christ, and we want to maintain this sincere, pure devotion to our groom. We are betrothed. Now, in ancient betrothal, it's a little different than engagement. It's not the same rules of engagement. Yeah, you see what I did there? This is ancient betrothal. Ancient betrothal was, hey, we're going to enter into a legal contract of marriage, but we're going to live apart. The groom's going to go away. The groom's going to go away. He's going to build uh, sort of an apartment on his father's house. The, the bride's going to get ready, get her bridesmaid. She's going to get her dress ready, and she's going to wait for the groom. And the groom's going to come back from his father's house, and the groom's going to come, and they're going to celebrate the wedding feast. And the marriage is consummated, and they finally live together under one roof. 
That's betrothal. Betrothal is not engagement where you can just ditch it at the last minute or leave them at the altar. If you uh, were sexually intimate with someone during your betrothal period other than the one you were going to marry and be sexually intimate when you're married, you committed adultery. You could commit adultery during the betrothal period. That's how serious this was. Think about Mary and Joseph. Joseph thought when Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit that she had committed adultery. He was actually going to divorce her quietly. They weren't actually at the wedding day yet. They were in the betrothal period. And so as we wait for our groom to come back for us, as he prepares a place for us, we are betrothed to him. We are waiting for him. And John 14, verse 1 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? That's what the groom would do during the betrothal period. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. That's exactly what Christ is doing. He has entered into this binding covenant. He will be faithful to his covenant. He has purchased us by his cross, by his own blood. And we are in this period where Christ is going to prepare a place for us. And in the meantime, he has given us sort of a seal and a sign and a guarantee of his faithfulness to this covenant. He has given all who believe the Spirit of God. He has given us the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. The Spirit is the guarantee of his faithfulness to us. The Spirit is the guarantee that he will keep all of his promises. 2 Corinthians 1 says, It's God who establishes us with you in Christ. And has anointed us. And who has also put his seal on us. And has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The spirit is sort of like that engagement ring. Except much stronger. This is a seal and a sign. That God will be faithful. That Jesus will come for us. That Jesus will prepare a place for us. And that we by his grace. We will make it to the wedding feast. Not because of our faithfulness. But because of his faithfulness. I remember so vividly shopping for Aaron's engagement ring. I wanted the ring to be the most unique ring that I could find on the earth. So I found a unique diamond. I found a separate band. I had them custom put it together. It took way too long, but in the end it was worth it. It's a beautiful ring. There's no ring like it on planet earth. And I worked hard for that. And it was important for me to be able to give that to her as a sign and a seal that, hey, I'm not going to leave you at the altar. And if you have the Spirit of God, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you have faith in Christ, Christ is going to be faithful to you. Christ is going to be faithful to us as the church. He's not going to leave us standing at the altar. Your life is full of suffering and temptation and difficulty. You feel weak every single day like I do. You don't feel worthy of this groom. We don't feel worthy of him. But he is faithful. The point is, he is the faithful groom. He pays the price. He gives the spirit. He goes to prepare a place. He's coming back for us. He's going to finish what he started. This is not about the bride. This is about the groom. And our king is coming. And we will see his face. And we will celebrate at the wedding feast. And the way we know that is he has given us the spirit as a guarantee. As we long for him. And lastly, when will the marriage be consummated? When is the wedding feast? When is the wedding day? It's simply when he comes. When Christ comes, the wedding feast will commence. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. The mark of a Christian, or one of the main marks of a believer, is that you long for the return of Christ. That you long to be with him. Paul said in Philippians 1, My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better by far. But to remain in the flesh right now is more necessary. Brothers and sisters, if we're the bride, we should long for the groom. This is the heartbeat of the Christian. An incorruptible love for Christ. The peace of God rests upon those who have an incorruptible love for Jesus because they've been transformed by his love for them. The love for Jesus transforms us into people who love Jesus. 
The love for Jesus has for us as his church transforms us into a church that loves Jesus. The mark of the Christian church, the bride, is love for Christ that spills out into how we speak and spills out into how we act and spills out into how we love one another, that spills out into how we give generously. It spills out into how we serve humbly. The groom loves his bride, and so the bride loves the groom and longs for the groom to come. I don't think my wife on our wedding day had any doubt that I would be there at all. And I don't have any doubt that he's coming for us because he's faithful. He's so faithful. He keeps his word every single time. So what do we do while we wait? We're in this betrothal stage. We're waiting for the wedding feast. We've entered covenant with the groom. The bridal dowry has been paid. The father chose us and gave us to Jesus. We're the bride. He's made us worthy. So what do we do as we wait? I'll give you one word. Fidelity. Fidelity. The calling of the bride waiting for the groom in the betrothal period is fidelity. To not try to take another spouse, an idol, another God. The calling in this stage of our lives as a church is to be loyal and faithful to Christ. We read earlier that Paul said, my fear is that you're led away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What I pray for every day over this church, multiple times a day, is that we would be marked by fidelity to the groom, fidelity to the Lord Jesus, that we would shun idolatry, that we would live in purity, that we would be loyal to the one who loved us and gave himself for us. The way in which we corporately and individually stay faithful to the groom is, number one, to avoid idolatry, to avoid idolatry. And the reason I say this is because idolatry is a strong word. We don't normally think of ourselves as prone to idolatry, but we are, we are. That's why John says, don't love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's why he says that we're tempted by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and pride and possessions. We're tempted by hedonism. We're tempted by covetousness and jealousy of what people have. And we're tempted to, to puff our chest out based on what we own. That's all idolatry is. It's loving the world and the things of this world. Coveting what other people have and longing for what they have. It's loving everything you can see and hear and smell more than you love the living Christ. That's idolatry. And so, so watch out, church, that as, as his bride, he's made us holy by his blood, but he calls us to resist the temptation of idolatry. Where does idolatry start? It starts right in here. Idolatry starts as a hunger and a thirsting for something other than Christ, something more than Jesus. And so I ask you, what are you hungering for and thirsting for more than Christ today, this morning? What has riveted your attention and your affection? What has riveted and grabbed hold of your emotions? What is it that you're longing for? That you're thirsting and hungry for, chasing after, galloping after? That's an idol. If you love it more than Christ. And the way the bride, the church, stays faithful to its groom is by avoiding idolatry. And the reason I bring that up is because in Ezekiel 16, it's too long to read right now. Go read Ezekiel 16. It'll kind of wake you up and shake you out of idolatry a little bit. Because in Ezekiel 16, God says to Israel, you're my wife, my bride, who I took to myself. And he uses very, very strong language of prostitution and whoring. He calls them those things. And he said, you, you've, you've gone after other gods. You've given yourself to other lovers. And that's about all I can say because there's kids in the room and I don't want to go into detail, but... 
It's very powerful language to say that the people of God who are in covenant with their groom have this temptation to give themselves to other gods. To prostitute themselves out to other gods. To love the creature rather than the creator. So church, we have this incredible opportunity in a positive way to say we won't be idolaters. We want our groom. We want Christ. And then on the other flip side of that coin is not only to avoid idolatry, but to live righteously. The reason I say live righteously rather than using some other kind of word is because in Revelation 19, in verse 7, right here in the middle, it says this. Let's rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Watch this. His bride has made herself ready. His bride has made herself ready. Hmm. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. And here's the explanation of what that linen is. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The mark of the bride is righteous deeds. The mark of the bride is righteous fruit. The mark of the bride of Christ, the church of the living God, is to avoid idolatry and put on righteous deeds. And the righteous deeds is the linen of the bride. It is the clothing that we wear until that wedding day. It is what we wear to the wedding feast, the righteous deeds of the saints. And there's a fear in the church today of of thinking that when we talk about righteous deeds and good works and all these things that we're somehow being legalists, but we're not. Otherwise, the Bible is legalistic. We understand that Jesus made us his bride by his blood. We understand Jesus made us his bride by laying his life down. We're not saying we're working for this. We're not saying we're trying to earn his love. We're saying that Jesus has clothed us and he's clothed us in righteous deeds. All the, all the clothing my kids have, we give to them. They wear the clothing. They walk in the clothing. They live in that clothing. They get dirty in that clothing. All the clothing is given to my kids. And the righteous deeds that we walk in as the bride are given to us by Christ. It's a gift. Even our good works are a gift. Even our good works are prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, right? Ephesians 2.10. Think about bearing fruit. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Where does the fruit come from? From the vine or the branch? From the vine. We don't produce fruit, we bear it. Jesus is the vine, he produces the fruit. We simply bear the fruit. The fruit hangs on us. The fruit is on us. We didn't come up with it, we didn't make it. We didn't produce it, Jesus did. Galatians 2 Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ through me. It says we're to to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Whose fruit is it? It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of Eddie. It's not the fruit of Sandra. It's not the fruit of Sarah or Chad or John. It's not the fruit of Reggie. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit is in us, and he is fruitful. He is holy. He is loving. He is pure. He's the one who fills us with joy and peace and love and all the rest. And we have this amazing privilege of being the bride of the groom who walks in righteous deeds, who walks bearing fruit in the spirit. And that fruit and those deeds are given to us. I'll show you that verse eight. These are granted to her. So we're not talking about legalism. We're talking about working out the salvation that has been freely given to us. Walking in the righteous deeds that he has granted to us. Wearing the fine linen as we head towards the wedding feast. That's the calling for us as the bride. That's the calling for us together. My prayer in my heart, and I, I, I know it is the, the heart and prayer of Jesus. I, I, I believe that through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, that Christ is present among us today. And I think he looks out upon us as his bride And I think he loves us. I know that he loves us. 
And Christ wants to say to us through the word we've just read, I have died for you. I have purchased you. You are mine. I will be faithful. I've given you the spirit. I've gone to prepare a place. I'm coming back for you. I will take you to myself. And church, he says, I've given you fine linen. Put it on. Put on the fine linen, the righteous deeds of the saints. Don't take another husband besides me. I am your groom. Wear the linen. Walk in obedience. Be faithful to me as I will always be faithful to you. Let's be completely laser focused, devoted to one groom and one groom only as a church. And that is Jesus Christ. Father, we bow before you in prayer, thanking you for a perfect bridegroom, a perfect Savior, the perfect righteousness of Christ. We thank you that he laid his life down for us, that you chose us for him. And that we are secure. And that there's never been a more faithful groom ever. And that he loves his bride. And we know, Lord, we confess that we are called to, as your word says, to fidelity in this age. Fidelity to one groom. Both in our private life, but especially in our corporate life together as a church. So we're asking that the Holy Spirit would work in us corporately and work in us privately to expose where there might be an idol, another little God that is taking the glory position in our lives. If there is any other idol that ever is propped up in this congregation, which I do not know of one, but if there ever is, Lord, we ask that you would expose that and demolish that idol. And it's so reassuring for for us this morning before your presence to acknowledge that even the righteous deeds that the bride walks in is given to her. That, that, That our fruit and our good works are not of us. We bear them, but you give them. You prepare them beforehand. And we're just so grateful that you love us in this way, that you're not a cold God. You're not, you're not far off. You're not indifferent. That's what I remember in this, this bridegroom language, that your affections are strong for us. And that, Lord, makes our affections for you rise. It really does. To know that you would love us, a dirty, filthy group of sinners, and make us lovely and make us spotless through the cross. It's amazing. And so we we prepare for communion now, Lord, in your presence, and we acknowledge that it is only by the blood and body of Christ that we are the bride and we are spotless and we're acceptable and fit for our, our, our groom, Jesus. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.